Alice Sondlin and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Welcome and thanks for tuning in to the Security Token Show. We're your hosts. I'm Kyle Sondland, and with me, as always, is Herwig Konings. And this week, we will be discussing issuing royalties and dividends with security tokens. But before we do, we proceed with our normal programming, starting with our Companies of the Week segment, followed by the industry news from last week, the latest in security token offerings, the trading activity from the secondary markets, and finally concluding with our main topic, which is very exciting. But before we dig into any of that, Herwig, I want to hear from you. Who is your Company of the Week for this week? Absolutely happy to be here, and I got a big one for our listeners this week. The Federal Reserve is getting behind blockchain, and that's thanks to the company of the week that I'm choosing, Ameribor, which is by a product actually created by the American Financial Exchange. You see, Ameribor is actually an Ethereum-powered alternative rate to Libor. So let me actually break that down for everybody, right? So Libor, which stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate, is a widely used benchmark for short-term interest rates that was hit with a series of scandals where bankers had actually been manipulating the lending rates based on over 300 trillion in contracts that led to billions of dollars in losses for both local municipalities in the US and businesses, according to an article by Forbes. And so naturally, when that happened, the Federal Reserve immediately moved towards creating an alternative, which is how the Alternative Reference Rates Committee, or the ARC, was formed to create the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, or the SOFR. And Ameribor is a private market solution, and it's used as an alternative to SOFR and uses blockchain as a part of its determination of the rates for Ameribor. And Richard Sander, the CEO of AFX, said, quote, We learned a great deal about this new and exciting technology and believe the blockchain has the potential to transform electronic trading and financial markets. AFX is committed to remain in the forefront of this new technology. And so not just for using blockchain technology in a novel way for finance, but for also having the Federal Reserve actually publicly support it as a solution, Ameribor by AFX is my company of the week, Kyle. Well, that's a great choice. I think just to wrap that up, let me make sure that I'm getting it right because we covered a couple different pieces there. So Ameribor has created a rate that is comparable to the LIBOR, which was traditionally used for short-term lending. And so they've created a different rate now that is on the Ethereum blockchain that they're leveraging? That is 100% correct. And now that everybody is moving away from LIBOR, the SOFR was created by the Federal Reserve, but in the end, this is now a private market solution alternative. Right, and so then they got it, it, it's supported by the Fed itself. This is a fantastic endorsement. So that's exciting, and congrats. Absolutely. Now you tell me, Kyle, who's your choice? My company of the week definitely may come as a surprise to some of our most loyal listeners, Herwig, because this week, Lottery.com distributed the first ever security token distribution to its token holders. In what was a landmark post-issuance action by LDCC and its issuance platform Securitize, we have some of the first news from the Lottery.com team in what seems like a long, long time. I'm preparing an article to break this down further regarding exactly what this means and what this token will do, but for context, Lottery.com issued one of the first trading security tokens, LDCC, on Open Finance Network 18 months ago. Since then, the team has been difficult to reach and there hasn't been much noise at all from anyone on that team regarding this this offering. A consequence of that lack of of noise was that the price fell significantly, hitting lows of almost 10% of its initial price at a dollar, now it's sitting at around 10 cents. However, since it does have some redeeming features, including the fact that it is now available to retail non-accredited investors via OFN using the Rule 144 exemption that we've covered here on the podcast before, and now they have actually distributed a royalty payment to their token holders. We're going to break down the mechanics of that and more in the main topic of this week's episode. So for now, I'm just going to take the time to congratulate Lottery.com and the LDCC token as my company of the week for issuing the first royalty payment on Securitize. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, we're, we're going to be breaking it down, as you said, on the main topic. It's a landmark move, and we'll tell you exactly why later on the show. But for now, we're going to jump right into it, into our usual news industry news segment. And with that, we're actually going to kick things off in Japan. And actually there in that region, there was last week announced a research group formed in order to attempt to quantify the challenges and solutions for digital currency and settlement. Chaired by a former head of payments and settlement systems at the Bank of Japan, Hiromi Yamauko, the group uh, is, is the chair, and the group is expected to meet several times and includes mega securities banks in Japan, including MUFG, Mizuho, and Sumito Mitsui. The research group was founded by DeCurrent Exchange, which is a crypto uh, exchange in Japan. And this uh, tops you know, more than three different blockchain research groups now that have already formed in Japan. And what is, you know, what I'm seeing is a fast mobilizing security token ecosystem. And in case you're interested, you can actually learn more about that in an article I wrote covering the region's activity on our Medium blog. Or you can just Google Japan security token, and I'm pretty sure it's the second link. Moving on back into the U.S., Big, J Big Bank J.P. Morgan issued a report last week saying that, quote, there is no country with more to lose from the disruptive potential of digital currency than the United States, and it revolves primarily around U.S. dollar hegemony, a.k.a. its dominance against other currencies. And the JPM analysts behind the report cited that the trade settlement and the SWIFT messaging system could be asked at risk as CBDC, central bank digital currencies, get issued. And strangely though, at the same time, the analysts did also say that there were benefits and advantages to a CBDC, and that ultimately though, that it's not quite as transformative as many hope it will be. The report, according to Bloomberg, says that, quote, offering a cross-border payments solution built on top of the digital dollar world particularly if designed to be minimally disruptive to the structure of the domestic financial system, would be a very modest investment to protect a key means to project power in the global economy. And they went on to say that for high-income countries in the U.S. in particular, digital currency is an exercise in geopolitical risk management. So breaking it all down, it kind of seems a little bit like a backwards report. Central bank digital currencies have the potential to be great, even for the U.S., but ultimately can hurt the U.S. dollar's dominance. So let's see if JPM is right in the end, or maybe they could potentially just be worried about their personal market dominance being threatened. After all, the plans for a JPM coin, a stable coin pegged to the U.S. dollar issued by J.P. Morgan, would not be nearly as valuable if the Federal Reserve issued one. Isn't it pretty funny how they recognize the benefits and they can't deny the fact that leveraging a stable coin, leveraging blockchain for this execution will have benefits. But because it, it is kind of against their business model and it would hurt them in a lot of different ways, it's not quite as transformative as many had hoped. It's just, it's funny how that works. We'll see if they can uh, withstand the <laughs> growing influence that CBDCs will have moving forward. Indeed. And certainly we also know the Federal Reserve has made comments about exploring the potential application. So we'll see how it all unfolds. And next up, we actually have an update in the unfolding saga that is the Open Finance Network story. As reported by Kyle on his market reports and also at strmarket.com, you can see OFN's trading volume has been lacking in comparison to other markets. And then actually on April 23rd, just a little bit more than a month ago, the platform suggested that it would delist all of its tokens if they did not re-sign and more importantly, repay new listing fees. So it wasn't really plainly said, but one could easily infer that the company was running low on operating cash. Then in another strange email announcement a few weeks ago, the platform said it would continue to trade all tokens. <laughs> now, no public announcements have been made by the firm regarding the situation, but LinkedIn did reveal something else to us. OFN has two co-CEOs right now, right? Juan Hernandez, who's the founder, and James Stonebridge. However, according to LinkedIn in an update, James Stonebridge updated to CEO and president of Open Finance, and Juan actually changed his position to managing director of Factor Labs. Nothing more can really be said about Factor Labs other than it says that it's an entity that is building a distributed future, according to LinkedIn. So, I mean, there's clearly a management shakeup as Juan was the original founder of the company, and James was brought in as the COO in 2018. 
Nothing further can be derived about the status of OFN, its state of finances, or anything else regarding that. And meanwhile, the tokens will still continue to trade. So more of this story will surely come out soon. And of course, we'll keep you updated here on the Security Token Show regarding that saga. I reached out to Juan for comment and haven't heard from him. I wanted to give him a shout out on Factor Labs and whatever he's working on, but unfortunately, couldn't find anything on it. So definitely a story we'll, we'll continue to monitor moving forward. We'll be sure to keep trying to get that scoop. And over in Houston, Texas, a real estate firm known as Gray Spear Capital has launched a tokenized real estate product, according to a press release by the company. And not much else can really be deferred about the actual STO from the statement, other than it is presumably one of the real estate firm's projects, and that the CEO, Hamza Ali, is a believer in blockchain for real estate and plans to use Ethereum as the underlying technology for the token. Of course, when we do find out more details about the offering, its terms, and how to participate, Kyle will have all that info for you on the STO news segment. You better believe it. And I want to give a shout out to SIBA, Switzerland licensed crypto bank, uh, which last week launched an educational platform for digital assets. They have developed some very simple logical guides to kind of walk people through the distributed ledger technology, how it works and how cryptocurrencies all come together. And they haven't really yet launched a course on security tokens, but the experience uh, and on the importance of understanding blockchain and its potential for finance is there and that's a critical and important thing for anyone to be able to learn. So I definitely recommend people check this out. It's available at cibaversity.swiss. That's university, but with Siba instead of the uni.swiss. So definitely check out that cool educational platform they put together there. And moving on, Cointelegraph's Adrian Zudzinski released an article collecting security token industry expert opinions, at least two of them anyway, sharing the highlights. The punchline is that the adoption will take time, of course, but with GSX's Nick Cohen and Black Manta Capital's Christian Platzer ultimately having a little disagreement on the speed of the adoption. And if you're on Cointelegraph, you might as well check out Samuel Haig's interview with DigiVault CEO Robert Cooper. Uh, who actually has some thoughts on security tokens himself. Uh, you know, regulatory clarity will spark widespread tokenization, says, the, says uh, Robert Cooper. And obviously based on his comments in the article, it looks like he's definitely in the camp that tokenization will be adopted sooner than later. So are we. And that's all the industry news that I have for you wonderful listeners. I'm going to hand it over to you, Kyle. Uh, to tell us more uh, about the industry events. But of course, for those of you who are new listeners, you can know that you can find any of the articles that Kyle and I discuss on the show over on medium.com, our blog on the, the different articles. It should be available in the description of wherever you're listening to. And of course, it's all sourced directly from stomarket.com slash news. Kyle, what do you got for us? Well, let's talk about some industry events. First off, we covered one last week that I'll remind you about, and it's whether the event from, uh, from a virtual panel regarding will digitizing capital markets create a whole new user experience? This is a great panel conversation. It's going to be very interesting to hear the thoughts. I think that the answer is probably going to be yes. So then the follow-up question <laughs> will be how. And so that's what we're going to hear from James Bowater, Tiana Baker-Taylor, Andrea Bonacento, and Jeffrey Sweeney, who are all entrenched in the space in one way or another. And so it's going to be very exciting. Definitely check that one out. That is Tuesday, June 30th from 11 to 1230 Eastern Time, talking about how a new user experience will emerge in capital markets through digitization. I believe that one's put together by Security Tokens Realized, always putting on a lot of great programming, now having gone all virtual, should be a good event. Absolutely, they host many great events and have given us recognition in the past, so thanks to that. Additionally, we have the Singapore Blockchain Week. It is still going on regardless of Corona because we're going virtual. So this is the Virtual Summit 2020 for Blockchain Week in Singapore. And so they're hosting this virtual event, which they've had over 5,000 attendees last year. And it's now organized and supported by the city's leading government agencies on July 21st through 23rd. It's hosted by the Blockchain Association of Singapore and is co-organized by the Next Change Group. And so it's going to cover many different blockchain themes around architecture and design, as well as many other pieces, but it will have its own section on security token offerings and asset tokenization, specifically focusing on tackling the challenges of security token issuance and distribution. 
that should be a great opportunity to learn about the growing Asian market for security tokens and how Singapore's views on it may differ or may stay the same to ones that we've expressed on the podcast before. It's a 25 registration fee to attend. I believe that that's for the full three-day experience. So it seems like good value for money for for many different events and and different topics that will be covered July 21st to 23rd. You're going to hear it on plenty more episodes. we got a couple weeks before that's going to happen. That'll be great. Like you said, I'm looking forward to probably hearing a lot of great news and updates and announcements that come out of that regarding the Asian security token ecosystem. Absolutely. I'm excited to hear about uh, how it goes. Now we're talking about some new security token offerings. We have one this week, and this is from Realty, the leader in tokenized real estate worldwide who has launched their 11th property in Detroit. Just like their previous issuances, 18900 Mansfield Street is a Section 8 property, meaning that a large portion of the rent is guaranteed by the Detroit government, resulting in dramatically less risk than a traditional rental property, especially in today's climate. These tokens represent ownership in the actual home itself that's being rented out, so you own a portion of the home in addition to a portion of the rental income earned from the property. Realty employees or employs rather a property manager to fix up the place and manage the tenant, and then after those management fees are removed from the rent, the full amount is then distributed to each token holder proportionally. The home is valued at $56,441, and they're selling a total of 1,100 tokens. The token price of just about $51, you're then entitled to the equity appreciation of that home in addition to an 11.09% dividend, which results in about $5.50 in yearly returns from dividends for every $51 spent. Accredited investors and international investors can participate, so definitely go check out Realty.co for more info. These tokens will be listed on Uniswap eventually. I also want to give a quick shout out to Cointelegraph writer Samuel Haig for a nice breakdown of Overstock and T-Zero's recent market performances. Sam used and cited security token market data in his article covering Overstock's explosive launch, so I definitely would like to recognize and thank him for that. Thanks again for your support, Sam. And moving into the market segment where we're talking about how everything's performing on secondary markets, our total security token market cap as of Monday, June 8th, is 110 million, which is up 10% from last week's 104.7 million. All right. The headline for the security token market performance yet again was overstock, with the digital dividend that continues to drive serious volume on T0, seeing over $500,000 in trading volume in just this week as the token's price jumped 17% in the last seven days. The public stock has outperformed the token, however, as the OSTK shares trading on NASDAQ are now up over 30% in the same time period. So it does seem like these two assets are tightly correlated. I mean, obviously they should be, but the token still seems to have a little bit less appetite from investors despite its success as the price is about half of what the public stock is currently trading for. T0, their their token that they've issued, TZROP, has also had strong trading volumes but its price has been relatively stable, which is a a nice break for them. Additionally, from other tokens, the rest of the market was relatively quiet. The one thing that was was interesting to mention was Realty, the the company that has been issuing all the real estate, their largest property, Fullerton Avenue, which is a 15-unit apartment complex, saw a really strong spike, reaching almost $190 a share at a 720K market cap earlier last week before cooling off by the end of the week now sitting around $170 at a 650 cap. So it's going to be fascinating to see real estate and, and watching these markets as such liquid instruments is just tremendous. And it's, it's really such a cool thing to see. On top of the equity appreciation, that property specifically receives a 12.76% yearly dividend paid in daily distributions as all of their other properties. So that's over $20 per share in dividends on top of the equity value increases. So even when these prices can fluctuate a little bit, there's your 20% your 20 buck cushion right there. That's amazing stuff. All right, Herwig. Well, I think that's time to, to break into the main topic this week. Well, Kyle, given your choice of lottery.com, you know, it seemed like it was only natural we took today's episode to really dig into the efficiencies of issuing royalties and dividends with security tokens. So let's of course first start by diving into lottery.com's upcoming royalty payment. Kyle, please walk our listeners through the details of that process. 
Yeah, so the company was thrust into the security token spotlight after launching a lottery security token offering to give investors exposure to an upcoming raffle the company was planning called the Global Impact Raffle. The idea centered around collecting raffle participation and incentivizing users to continue playing through gamified economic mechanisms. The token offers investors 7% of the net revenue on the planned global impact raffle. However, since the inception of the LDCC token launched in late 2018, not much has been heard from the initiative. For the recent royalty payment, Lottery provided investors with a web link, which they can use their form of payment. They can choose their form of payment, which ranges from over 120 fiat currencies to cryptocurrencies like a USD stablecoin, Ether, and many others. The entire process happened online and is in a testament to the work that Securitize has done with their DS protocol, that underlying issuance layer, to have full distribution that occurs compliantly on chain. You got to love those smart contracts. I mean, it sounds, Kyle, like it's safe to say that the process of the royalty is basically the same as the process of a dividend. And if the efficiencies in using dividends and royalties are in essence the same, I think it's important to really highlight this using another example. We know that the Curzio equity token has said to investors in their STO that the company plans to pay a dividend in the future. Let's walk through how they are using smart contracts to issue that dividend and how for them as an issuer, it's now far more efficient than their public market counterpart. That sounds great. Lead the way. Great. I'll do that happily. So for the CEO token, the, which is the 10th token, by the way, to be issued by Securitize, was launched by Curzio Research and has real-time access to knowing at all times who its beneficiaries are because they issued a security token. And if the token were to be trading on a secondary market or transferred via Securitize's instant access tool, which is the expectation, then even if the token changes hands, Curzio Research will still know who its owners are 24-7 in real time. And from there, when they decide to issue a dividend, the process can be done instantly using smart contracts to programmatically distribute the value pro rata to the ownership of all wallet holders. That's the capability of issuing instant dividends. It's, it's truly amazing. This is simply not the case when it comes to public markets. Dividends can take weeks to pay out because the issuer has to work with the broker to figure out who gets paid what, and from there the issuer needs to go back and update the transfer agent. That's a massive inefficiency compared to our CEO token example. In fact, Carlos Domingo, the CEO of Securitize, highlights in an article with Coindesk that there are middlemen that thrive on these efficiencies, right? CompuShare sits on over 18 billion in unpaid dividends that they manage for a fee until they get paid, leading to some $250 million in annual revenues alone for them. Furthermore, Kyle, we know that issuing dividends on chain has a lot of additional benefits beyond this. Let's run through some of them. <laughs> 18 billion in unpaid dividends that they just get to charge a fee on because they don't get issued, that's just, yeah, that, yeah. that's inefficient. <laughs> We've got, we definitely have some, uh, some room there we can, we can definitely squeeze out. So transparency, as you said, is a key to reducing a lot of those unnecessary middleman fees that you mentioned. I mean, recording dividend history alone on an immutable ledger is a process that has never really been successfully executed in this way at scale, which allows for tremendous benefits for issuers and financial intermediaries to leverage advanced analytics to better understand their shareholders and to more effectively estimate wait times, transfer fees, and more. The smart contracts themselves offer tremendous benefits for firms as the expense of issuing the dividend itself is now dramatically cheaper than manual issuance. Between instant deployment, cheaper execution, and detailed investor analytics, there's really no reason an issuer should prefer manual dividends over its tokenized counterpart. Additionally, you can now send all sorts of dividend or royalty payments to investors. You're not just limited to cash. Traditionally, investors get paid in fiat. Not getting paid in USD was seen as a currency risk because other fiat currencies were seen as inferior to, for some investors. But now with smart contracts, a company like Curzio Research could actually send Bitcoin, crypto, additional shares by issuing more CEO tokens, or it could even distribute other security tokens in its treasury, any of which would be issued, tracked, and managed on-chain for full transparency and efficiency. Maybe Herwig really wants to be paid in gold. Well, now Curzio could use cash to get gold-backed tokens that he could then issue a dividend with. Now, we can be paying dividends with just about anything instantly. Now, startups could offer stock dividends to investors each year that they held the token, or many other innovative possibilities. 
And you could always just be boring and use a good old USD stable coin like USDC or DAI and pay US dollars on chain to token holders, as we saw with Lottery.com, who offered more than 120 different payment options for their royalty. It's simply unheard of in public markets and even traditional off-chain private markets. I mean, now you're giving me goosebumps, Kyle, because this is where the possibilities start to get endless. On-chain payments are actually a massive pillar of the DeFi community in their lending applications and other decentralized finance applications to instantly and programmatically pay dividends on-chain to token holders. There's actually more than a billion dollars of DeFi tokens now locked up in smart contracts being programmatically Pay back. You know, at the end of the day, paying royalties or dividends are just another one of those major, major game changers that security tokens are bringing to the table. It's not to be underlooked when compared to the benefit of ease of transfer leading to liquidity. On chain payments will fundamentally change capital markets. You heard it here. I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. And with that, Kyle, I think we can conclude today's show. As always, thanks for tuning into another episode. And for those of you who are new listeners, Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Please always feel free to send in questions, comments, or feedback for us. You can reach us directly, both Kyle and I, on Twitter and LinkedIn. It's another great episode, Herwick. Thanks again for everyone listening, and we hope to catch you all next week. Talk to you soon.